There's some shit going on with black people right now. There's like a civil war going on with black people. And there's two sides. It's black people and there's niggas. The niggas have got to go. Every time black people want to have a good time, and the last niggas fuck it up. <laughs> hey, I love black people, but I hate niggas, bro. Oh, I hate niggas, boy. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about this. We have a group of black men on the left. And a group of black males on the right. I'm really not comfortable with that nigga sir. I told you why I used it. I told you that's how they refer to themselves. They shouldn't have a problem with other people referring to them as that. I am black, so it shouldn't matter. But to me, it does matter. I'm not going to call them niggas. Even though I really think the word fits. I'm just going to refer to them. And this is true. This is factual. As ghetto males. Versus black males. Now, before I even, these are not pictures, these are videos. Before I even roll the videos, just looking at the images alone, look at each individual in these images. Now, let's be honest. Do we see anything that would garner respect? That would make you think they're probably intelligent, decent, respectable, honorable. <sighs> Have you noticed something? The group on the right, they pretty much all look alike. The group on the left, they pretty much all look alike too. If you talk to anyone in this group, they're going to pretty much all sound very similar in the way that they speak. You talk to anyone in this group on the right, they're pretty much all going to sound very similar in the way that they speak. The perceptions and attitudes that these gentlemen have on the right is going to be almost identical to each other, with very few exceptions are Variance or deviation. Same with those on the left. Similar values, similar goals, similar mindset, similar interests. A brotherhood, as it were. And it literally is a brotherhood. And the same with these on the right. This is a brotherhood as well. The difference is, this is a brotherhood of thugs. This is a brotherhood of gangsters. They claim it. So... I, I will recognize it. They're gangsters. And they're in a brotherhood. They are united in that way. This is the National Society of Black Engineers. And this is the chair of it, Calvin Phelps. It's a brotherhood also. Not any and everybody can join this brotherhood. You have to be black. <laughs> But more importantly, you have to be an engineer or an aspiring engineer. You have to have a certain amount of intelligence. They expect you to conduct and carry yourself a certain way because you represent them. Same with this group. Not any and everybody can become a part of it. You have to represent. You have to prove yourself worthy. You have to get in. You have to be accepted. And then you have to represent what they represent. You have to be able to represent it. You see. He would never be accepted into this group. And he 
would never be accepted into this group. <sighs> now, if any of these men on the left wanted to be accepted into this group, they could do what they needed to do. But they would no longer be who they are, because that's not who they are. If any of these on the right wanted to be accepted into this group, for the majority of them, it would be impossible. But it's conceivable to me that for some of them, it might even be possible. Because you have young men who, because of a lack of direction and primarily a lack of male, strong male leadership, they gravitate towards a group like this rather than a group like this. And some of them do have potential. I believe that and I know it for an absolute fact. You might not know it from looking, but some of them do. If you look at some of the things that gangsters do successfully, some of it requires a certain amount of planning, a certain pl amount of leadership, a certain amount of organizing, a certain amount of intelligence, even things that are illegal, plotting crimes successfully, organizing a crew, coming up with a plan for bringing in drugs, for marketing it, for selling it, for having a system of reward, system of punishment, assist, understanding the difference between uh, expenses and profit, income and outgo financially, making smart decisions. I'm not trying to glamorize any of this. I detest it with every fiber of my being. But I want to point that out. Because if they were totally hopeless, there would be no point in this video. Because I am not making this video for these gentlemen on the left and the various black people that I'm going to be showing. I'm primarily making this video for the benefit of those who might fall into the category on the right. And for those who give a damn. Because we all have to live in this society. And they exist whether we like it or not. <laughs> there are some of the represented on the left who at one point were represented by those on the right and I'm going to show you that but first of all let's hear what Calvin Phelps has to say uh, it says that really engineers are the builders and the shapers of society because all of the things that are modern conveniences you know you can look across the water you see the bridges in Pittsburgh you see the buildings the cars that got you here the planes you know for all of the 8,000 people who are coming to this conference that's all engineering you know when you go home and you get up 8,000 black engineers engineers are the builders of society you gentlemen on the right what do you have to say about that And don't get it twisted. They're not actors. This is the real deal. And they want you to know that. <laughs> On your computer, that's engineering. When you're in school and you have a calculator, that's engineering. So really, engineers are kind of the foundation of our society. They're the way that we progress. They're the way that we solve problems and make sure that we're all able to live successfully in this world. Yes, engineers engineers aren't made in college. It's something that's not necessarily intuitive, but when you look at the data, when you look at the research, you actually find that students from grades three to five is about when engineers really start being made because particularly for women and minorities, fifth grade is when you start to see an achievement gap in math and science. In the third grade, women and minorities tend to perform just as well as any of their peers in math and science. In the fourth grade, you start to see a little bit of a dip. But then by the time the fifth grade hits, there's an achievement gap, and that achievement gap only grows larger as they get older. So if you want to have people who are 
who are math and science capable. If you want to create a STEM capable workforce, you have to make sure that you're catching students very, very early to make sure that you can stop them and say, no, you're not going to stop liking math and science, but you can do math and science. It's important that you that you understand it, that you're able to perform these calculations because you're going to need it later on in life. So Nesby's premier way to, to get, address that third through fifth grade gap is the program called the Summer Engineering Experience for Kids. You heard it known as SEEK. Uh, now, seriously, <clears throat> do you really want to infer that just because there is shared ethnicity that the black people represented on the left, and I'm going to show you a number of clips, are the same as the black people represented on the right? Nothing could be further from the truth. Let's see what he has to say. 13's nigga cannabis laws. We some demons downtown. You can get in the blood. Look cut. Devil bad. What brown side? Those stendos. Booing little ski talks. Hearing like commando. 19. Now imagine living around this. That's what you. This is what you, where you live. This is your home. This is the society you come up in. This is the pattern that you see. Now, I'd be willing to make a bet of one thing, and that is that the majority of the males in the image on the right absolutely, positively were not raised by a strong father figure. I'd be willing to bet that the majority of the gentlemen on the left were raised by both a father and a mother. They come from a whole different structure. That does not mean that those on the right are hopeless or that people in a similar circumstance are hopeless. Far, far from that. You just have to recognize what you face, and that people do have a tendency naturally to emulate that which they are around and that which they see. But if everything you are around is negative, you have to go against what is natural, go against it completely in order to become better and do better. The Logistics of where you live do not have to regulate you to be a certain way. You don't have to do that. It doesn't matter how many people around you, if you're a young male, who you see with your their, their pants falling off like that. The same thug, look, swag, whatever you want to call it, emulating each other. Some of you may be thinking, okay, this is just a rap video. He's going, okay, you want to see the real thing? First of all, this is the real thing, but you really want to see it hardcore? Give me a moment. I'll show it to you. Never been Highway 170 be a residence. Nigga, I'll be the youngest of the highway clicking. I'm a state rapping this wick city. All the time to teach you a lesson. Use the brown on the highway. Pulls it in my driveway. With a click of gorillas, you know I'm at the highway. Bees off the 17, back on the scene. The bunch of hood niggas distributing, cracking the free. And when we show you how we do it, prime example of the G. And we can show you how to make my. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> Keep calling themselves niggas. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, back to town, Girk Town, Zion City. 
I'm from the lower nine, Mr. Dean, but we don't mind dying. The only thing I wanted to do was grow up in New Orleans and go to the NBA and save my family. Everybody thought I was going to go to the NBA like my little buddy Avery Johnson. Now, I see Avery on TV and I said, go, Avery. That should have been me. No, it shouldn't have, because that wasn't my calling. That wasn't my calling. Many of us are caught up in things that we have not been called to do. Many of us trying to be rappers and shake dancers and this and that, when we've been called to be something greater. One night I was playing basketball in the city of New Orleans and I took a long jump shot. One of the few I did that a funky come around the back through the leg. One of the long, few jump shots I missed, jerk shade off the rim. Now I went to get the ball, but a young man beat me to the ball. And he grabbed the ball in my arm and they went that way. And I went this way and I suffered a traumatic shoulder separation. My coach picked me up and he took me to the hospital. We got to the hospital. The doctor walked in and he looked and he said, oh no. And he ran back out. And he came back in with three more doctors and all four of the doctors got around me. They took a sheet and they tied me up and they did like a tug of war and popped my shoulder back in. The doctor said, son, we have two things to tell you. I was like, what? They said, one, you suffered a traumatic shoulder separation. You'll never be able to play basketball again. They said, two, we don't know how long it'll take for your shoulder to heal. My coach picked me up and he took me home. He said, I'm sorry, son. The dreams are destroyed. And he got to my house and he knocked on the door. Knock, knock, knock. My mom answered the door. He said, Mrs. Mack, I'm sorry to tell you, but your son has separated his shoulder and he'll never be able to play basketball again. My mom looked at me and she only had one thing to say. She said, what are you going to do now? We told you to study. We told you to study. I said, Mama, what about my shoulder? She said, shut up and get in this house. I said, Mama, we need more like that. I went in my bedroom. I laid in the bed, and I was wondering what I was going to do, Darren. I looked up. I said, God, what am I going to do? And God said, boy, don't worry about your shoulder, because you're going to do more for this world with your head than you ever thought you'd do with your legs and your arms. I got up the next day. And I went to school to find my favorite teacher, Miss V. When I walked in, I said, Miss V, my shoulder. She said, shut up, Calvin. We heard about your shoulder. She said, but what are you going to do now? We told you to study. We told you to study. I said, I don't know, Miss V. I said, I think I'm going to be an engineer. <laughs> she said, who? You? See, Nesby, sometimes it's the people closest to us who really don't believe in our dreams. It's a person that's sitting right next to us. The person in the suit, our boy on our team, who doesn't believe that we can dream what God has put in our heart. So I'm from the lower nine. She doesn't believe that people like us, or people like me can dream to aspire to something so great. She said, who? You, Calvin? She said, do you know what an engineer does? I said, no, but it sounds real good. She said, well, look, if you're going to be an engineer, you have to go take this test. I said, what test? She said, the SAT. Now, people, I was ignorant. And don't get bent out of shape when people call you ignorant. Ignorant means you just don't know. Stupid means there's no hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> Too many of us acting stupid. <laughs> I was just ignorant because I grew up in a house with no father dropped out of school in eighth grade to pick cotton. My mother went to a state approved Negro high school. I was so ignorant when she told me to go take the SAT. I thought SAT meant Saturday. <laughs> and then I knew it meant Saturday because she told me the test was on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so that Friday, I took my little girlfriend to the game and support our team. Then after the game, we went to a little dance to get our boogie on. And I took her home, and I got up on Saturday morning to go take my Saturday test. When all the kids like you had shown up, who had done what they were supposed to have done, they were all nervous and biting their nails, I put my head on the table. They had to wake me up. They said, young man, wake up. They gave me that test, and I was so ignorant. I didn't know that word as to that word as to that word. I didn't know any of those words. So, Nesby, you know what we do, and we don't know what we don't, we don't know what we're supposed to know. I started going A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D. I said, well, I better change this thing up. C, B, C, B, A, D. <laughs> I looked around. I was the first one finished. I like a bunch of dummies. <laughs> I put my head back on. They had to wake me up. They said, young man, go home. I went home. That's when we had to wait on all the scores, Daryl. Six weeks later, I went to the mailbox, and I ripped it open. And I saw the scores, and I pulled them out, and I ripped them open. And I looked at them. I said, oh, yeah. And I went to school, and I found Miss V. When I walked in, Ms. V said, Calvin, you got him. I said, Ms. V, I got him. She said, Calvin, how did you do? Ignorantly and confident, I looked at her and said, I got 84%. She said, you got 84% on the SAT? That's unbelievable, Calvin, especially for you. She said, but Calvin, I never heard the test explained in percentages before. <laughs> she, <laughs> she said, Calvin, what's your raw score, your total score? Ignorantly and confidently, I looked in her eyes and I screamed, 840. She was shaking her head. She said, no, son, you got some issues. 
Just take count of the tests. It's not out of 1,000. The test is out of 1,600. You don't have 84%. You barely have 50%. That's not good, Cal. We have to go take that test again. I said, oh, no, not that Saturday test. I'll stick with my Friday test. I do much better on Friday. <laughs> she, said, she, said, she said, well, look, if you're going to be an engineer, you have to go to college. I said, that. She said, as a college recruitment fact, you know, I'm in Superdome on Saturday. Saturday, I went down to that Superdome. I kicked the door open. I walked in. The first table I saw, Dr. May was a Georgia Tech engineer. I'm like, God, this is a divine intervention. I want to be an engineer. First table I see the Georgia Tech engineer. I go over to the Georgia Tech table. And the guy sitting there said, what can I do for you, son? I said, sir, I'd like to be an engineer. He said, you came to the right place. We the rambling record on Georgia Tech and heck of an engineer. I said, yeah. He said, uh, son, what's your SAT score? Ignorantly and confidently, I looked at him. I screamed, 840. He was shaking his head. He wouldn't even give me an application. You know? <laughs> They're like, oh, you can't come down to school with no 840 SAT. I never even heard anything like that. <laughs> See, Nesby, we have to realize just because a school is ranked number one, that doesn't mean it's number one for you. Wherever you are, whatever school you're in, I don't care whatever the ranking, you can leave there and go around the world. <laughs> I'm closing it out. The greatest thing the man at Georgia Tech did for me, he said, we can't do anything for you. But he just happened to point out an HBCU by the name of Morehouse College. He said, go over there. They may be able to help you. And I went over to Morehouse College, wounded. And I said, bro, that man over there sent me over here. The guy in Morehouse said, what can I do for you? Son, he said, I, I said, I'd like to be an engineer. He said, you came to the right place. He said, son, what's your SAT score? I said, uh, can we talk about this one? <laughs> I whispered. I said, hey, boy. He was shaking his head. <laughs> he said, I tell you what, son, you're a diamond in a rough, but a diamond show enough. Sign right here and come to Morehouse. We'll make you into a doctor. We'll make you into a lawyer. We'll make you into an engineer in June 1985. My mom took me to Morehouse College. Now, people, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, back in town, Girtown, Zion City. I'm from the Lord Nine, where we don't mind dying. We talk funny in New Orleans, and we don't even know it. You can be honest with me. In the aftermath of Katrina, you was watching television going, what language is this? What country? What do they say? <laughs> we talk funny. When I got to Morehouse, everybody laughed at the way I talked because I was saying things like, I'm body body. How you do that there? I'm the man right here. You heard me, little Wodies, off the easy for sheezy up in here, cousin. <laughs> Just like you, they didn't know what I was saying. They said, see, spot run. I said, no. They said, right. Don't pass go. Go directly to remedial reading. <laughs> they said, boy, you reading on about an eighth grade level. <laughs> and can you imagine the pain and indignation I felt every day when he used to make me go down to the basement of a building called Wheeler Hall at 18 years old with middle schoolers when kids like you was going to world lit and English cop because you had done what you were supposed to have done. And every day I had to sit before a computer and they would let the words go by faster and faster and faster until I was able to read at the place where I was supposed to be reading. My friends called us LD for Louisiana dummies. Benjamin Elijah May says that when you find out that you're behind in a race of life, you have two choices, run faster or quit. My friends laughed and they laughed and they laughed and I ran and I ran and I ran. After starting Morris with remedial reading, 0.0, .0 credit, I finished Morris for three and a half years, number one in mathematics. Number five in the largest class that Moss had ever produced, Magnum Cum Laude, Phi Beta Kappa. Thank you. Thank you. Rest in my soul, never born again, and he gets down to the click. Real niggas call me Nike, cause I'm checking the bitch. Braids on the highway to be exact. Terrace Road, then we moved to Lennon's Court when I was a black foe. As a dead nigga got introduced to the hood. Okay. How do you like where I stop these videos at? Young boy on the right. Raising his right hand. A real man on the left. Who used to be this boy on the right. He's raising his left hand. You see, this is why I'm doing this. It's not to belittle or criticize or insult. Well, it is to criticize. But it has to be said. It has to be talked about. We don't talk about it enough. And 
I applaud this man. I applaud him even more than I would someone who did not come out of this environment. Whatever, whatever he said, I don't even remember what he said, but we don't mind dying. He's basically trying to tell you, I came from the hood, the ghetto, thug life, all of that. That's what he's trying to tell you. He grew up in the streets hard. But I want little boys like this and the parents of little boys like this who may feel you're stuck in that environment to know that your little boy who's already emulating these bigger boys who haven't become men yet and because he doesn't have a real man for an example, he may have a father but it's not a real man. This is all he knows. This is what he knows. He's already playing the part. Because that's what he knows. Somebody needs to tell him. It might sound a bit better coming from him. But somebody needs to tell him. That this can turn into this. And if you forgot what he said, let me play it back. He didn't just become an engineer. The man was barely literate. He got a, what, an 840 on his SAT? Like 50% didn't even pass it? <laughs> he could barely read. But he did what he had to do. He's an engineer today. I'll go directly to remedial reading. <laughs> In Mars, remedial reading, 0.0, .0 credit. I finished Mars for three and a half years, number one in mathematics. Number he finished Morehouse in three and a half years, number one in mathematics. I finished Mars for three and a half years, number one in mathematics. Number five in the largest class that Mars had ever produced, magnum cum laude, phi beta kappa. After starting Mars for remedial reading, 0.0, .0 credit. I finished Mars for three and a half years, number one in mathematics. Number five in the largest class that Mars had ever produced. Number five in the largest class they had ever produced. So that means he went to school with what some people would refer to as uppity Negroes, which just because they didn't grow up in this ghetto environment, he kicked all of, them, all of their asses collectively. Number five in the largest class ever produced. And to you... <laughs> Calvin Mackey, I tip my hat. And to you, young man, I shake my head. And I want you to know that you can do better. There's a whole world out there. And it doesn't look anything like this world you're growing up in. Introduced to the hood and I smoke my first day. When we move to the wood, I don't fuck with single bill. I'm getting big face paper and bitch, I might get paid. Like I'm a big face player. I never been a bitch, nigga. Real nigga in my bank. And I've been by Jack says my name was Lil J. In the booth and in the streets, me and my dog go ride. My click can't be stopped like the Spurs and no fire. I'm excited, what we represent. I grew up with a rapper by the name of Master P. Master P around this country to the tune of $450 million with one message. And he said, if it, don't, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. As grammatically incorrect as that is, he made over $450 million. But he taught it to the world. And we've taught our children that the only thing that matters is instant gratification. If anybody in the room has kids, you know what I'm talking about. Because our children want money. And when do they want it? Now. I'll come to your conference. I'll take your test. I'll come to your company. You give me some money. We can't get you to cut the grass, shovel the snow, wash the car, clean your own behind. Let's we give you some money. That's our downfall. Now, now if he said, don't make dollars, don't make sense, I want to flip that as the rap group Cash Money would say. If I use scholars, I want to look at the inverse of it. If it don't make dollars, don't make sense, the inverse of that is, is that if it make dollars, it makes sense. I want to know if raping this young lady makes sense because it definitely make dollars. I want to know if the killing and the pillaging that we see in our neighborhoods makes sense because it definitely make dollars. I want to know if the selling of drugs and the destruction of families and communities and the making of crack babies makes sense because it definitely make dollars. I want to know if the Ill, immoral, unethical behavior by politicians and corporate execs makes sense because it definitely make dollars. 
So if you believe, so if you believe that the sole purpose of education is only money, then all those dastardly things that I just described, that justified, and every pimp, pusher, player, prostitute, hustler should be left alone to roam, maim, kill, and destroy our way of life and our children. Here we need proof that the sole purpose of education cannot be about money. W.D. Du Bois said the purpose of education is not to make men and women into doctors and lawyers and engineers. He said the purpose of education is to make doctors and lawyers and engineers into men and women.